One thing that I forgot to mention um, was that, of course, in our society and popular culture, once sexuality is made transactional, once, in other words, and once sex becomes traded for some sort of material good, whether that's cash or a gift, as in um, that which one finds at sugardaddy.com or Ashley Madison or any one of these sorts of websites or economies, the idea is that from uh, in our popular culture that it's somehow bad, immoral, um, it's no longer pure or good um, sexuality or emotional interchange. Um, and of course, this, this is a legacy that's very much um, that comes out of the Christian tradition in the West and is therefore highly culturally particular. Not all cultures would agree with that kind of assumption. Okay, now we're going to turn to the uh, Harley, Holly Wardlow's article. She has a fantastic book on the same subject. I almost had us read this book instead of Feeding Desire. Um, so if you're interested, I recommend that you go ahead and, and check out the book. So once again, we're returning to Papua New Guinea, a place where gender, the gender binary is very strict and real and it separates, rigidly separates uh, human experience. This is also a place where femininity is understood as polluting like among the Sambia from um, Guardians of the Flutes. It's also a place, as I mentioned earlier this semester, uh, where physical aggression is um, very prevalent and in fact, um, many times celebrated. It's a place where homicide and physical violence against women is, is terrifyingly common. Wardlow des describes the Huli as having, quote, a cultural context where aggression is an effective means of expressing and defending one's desires and one's interpretation of social reality. In other words, it's a place where aggression is valued and matters. And actually committing acts of self-harm as in finger lopping, which she describes in her book, this is when women um, want to seek social redress or to express their outrage, they might cut off their own fingers. Um, so Wardlow says that these kinds of self-harm support the truth of women's um, voices or arguments, not that it makes them truthful, but that women take use these techniques to say, look, I'm telling you what I'm telling you is real. Um, especially when her uh, brothers or her father or other men in her life um, do not listen to her. And Wardlow also describes Huli women as being very pr um, proud of the fact that when they are good fighters and being very boastful of their aggression and fighting skills, that's true of who, many Huli women, even those who are not passenger women. So in other words, self-harm the kinds of uh, an example of agency, which of course is very troubling to hear. So here's an image of, of course, Melanesia, and then more specifically, uh, Papua New Guinea. I'm going to show another map right now, and I've outlined precisely where um, where um, or those working in the region where where the Huli um, live. So they're hort horticulturalists. That means they're they're growing food. They're growing food for themselves for their consumption their subsistence economy, but they're all economy, but they're also um, enacting a cash-based economy. So Wardlow describes how they're moving from just kind of growing things for themselves to consume and share amongst kin. That's how it used to be here, you know, well before colonialism, but increasingly as capitalism enters this part of Papua New Guinea, now people are looking for jobs where they can earn cash and then go buy things in stores, etc. Um, they also live in a bride wealth system or society. Those of you who take in cultural anthropology hopefully already have some idea of what this is. When I say bride wealth, well, that is a system in which the groom provides money, um, in this case, uh, a gift, in this case, money or pigs um, to the uh, bride's family. Now, most of this cash will go to the bride's father. Why is that? Well, way back in the day, her dad also wanted to marry. He was a single man and he needed to get enough money so that he could give his potential bride's family, you know, the bride wealth they wanted. So at any rate, when his daughter 
becomes married, she gives him her bride wealth and he takes that and repays all of those who gave him money when he needed it for his bride wealth. So in other words, there's a sense in which woman becomes kind of traded in for cash, right? On a structural level, that's what's happening. Although of course, Huli women also were horrified when Wardlow described um, uh, herself as living in a society where there wasn't bride wealth. And she writes about how they thought that was just really preposterous. How could she have any self-respect if she didn't, you know, um, search for any bride wealth? So of course, this is all um, a question of cultural perspective as well. But were those very clear that this custom is changing? That you know, it's not always the fathers that have to get all the bride wealth money now, but as 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 conceptions of person and family and women's rights change in this part of the world, the expectation isn't always that the father should get the money from Bridewell. So I'm just going to repeat myself here, but I want to really once again highlight these points. There's a very strict gender binary. It rigidly organizes human experience, the idea that women are polluting. This There's also this unique concept, well, unique to us or very different from our society in which um, Wardlow describes that men are considered to be the epitome of beauty among the Huli. In other words, where in the West, women are often understood as potential sex objects or who should be seeking beauty or beautifying themselves um, for the male gaze, right? Um, in, a, in a heteronormative American society, um, the Huli don't see women as ever being beautiful. The idea is that men are beautiful and that women are, are not. And once again, this is a society where homicide um, and physical violence against women is, is disproportionately very high. Um, and I have pictures here of pigs and uh, yams, sweet potatoes, because these are the kind of foods that the staple foods of, of uh, well, in Pap throughout Papua New Guinea more generally. Now, whereas in GF, remember that's the village where Rogers did field work in France, um, among the Huli, women's political sphere of influence is encompassed by that of men. Who, um, Wardlow writes, women are seen as importantly exerting agency within their own sphere, but this sphere is encompassed by the male sphere, which in which sociopolitical relations are shaped. Construction and enactment of female agency is largely encompassed by male agency and male authored projects. So here she's kind of agreeing with Rosaldo, if you recall back to what Rosaldo argued, and she basically said, okay, we can think of you know, men and women as occupying different spheres, and sometimes women can assert agency, as in Roger showed in the domestic sphere, but you know, not all spheres are alike, and that domestic sphere just isn't as powerful as the kind of public sphere, and that's certainly the case among the Huli. Another big difference is that among the Huli, um, husbands give cash directly to their children rather than giving it to the wives who can give it to the children or to organize family budgets. Um, and and uh, Wardlow spends a lot of time describing husbands claiming that all women want to spend their money on is clothes and cigarettes. So, you know, women don't even have that control within the domestic sphere like those French peasant women did that, that Rogers described. Now moving on to the concept, the identity, the category of passenger women. Um, it's both a stigmatizing slur, but also an identity that some of these women have come to embrace. Passenger women appear to engage in sex work, the kind of things that they're doing and acting look like sex work to us. But in fact, uh, Wardlow argues that their initial motives, the main reason why they started to get uh, look for transactional sex had nothing to do with a desire to earn money. She even writes how some of them, you know, had sex with a, a man who was a stranger to them and then he gave them money. And they were surprised by that, especially if they're working, if they had gone to the city from one of these rural villages. So it doesn't really have anything to do with this idea of survival sex. They weren't doing this to get money to survive. They were doing this for a very different reason, out of anger and resistance to their kin. 
So they're not, passenger women are not exercising radical resistance to the system, but they're actually really critiquing men's failures to live up to their cultural expectations. Once again, she writes, it was emotion, not economics, that first impelled them to engage in extramarital sex with multiple partners. Now in her book on passenger women, Wardlow um, talks about this term called negative agency. So you won't have seen this, I believe you shouldn't have seen this in the article because it's not mentioned there. But this is how um, Wardlow just finds negative agency. The refusal to use their, you're talking about passenger women, the refusal of passenger women to use their bodily ways, their energies in ways expected of them. And particularly the refusal to, excuse me, to use their bodily energies for other social projects. What is she talking about here? If you're unsure, you might want to pause and go back to the article, figure out what is she saying about what are they refusing to do? What is she critique? What is she, what is she talking about here? Well, she's talking about, of course, the fact in which uh, many of these passenger women are opting out of typical marriage patterns, right? Um, they might have been um, abused by a male partner and particularly for those unmarried passenger women, that being their families didn't yet get bride wealth, but they might be seeing some man. When that man abuses them and her brother, brothers, her dad doesn't come in to defend her, she says, you know what? Screw it and goes off and leaves them. And this leaves the family in a bind, her brothers, her father, because they're not going to get any of her bride wealth. So passenger women trouble ideas of sex work. I've kind of gotten ahead of myself to get the sting of the argument. Um, they trouble sex work because for, for various reasons, the way we think of sex work um, as like sex for money. Sometimes passenger women um, actually get cash. Sometimes they got a gift. And of course, as I've already mentioned, some of them didn't even know that, that that was like a thing until they moved to a city and started um, engaging extramarital relations and they were given money in return. Um, sometimes they can be one-off sexual interactions. Sometimes passenger women have recurring relationships um, with a particular, excuse me, have a recurring, recurringly see the same man many times in ways that look different to us than what we would expect sex work to look like in the popular imagination. Um, this takes place in rural areas as well as urban areas. And while the man may be a stranger, this the men that, that the passenger woman has sex with, <coughs> excuse me, outside of marriage, can be someone she knows very intimately. So another thing that I typically do in, if we were meeting in class is I would put you into four different groups and have us look at each part of the argument in the article. Instead, I'm going to very briefly go over these points. I do want to remind you that this should not be a substitution for reading the article. Um, of course, there's a final exam where all this material's on it. And um, I think if you both read the article and listen to my lecture, you should hopefully understand it better. This article and Mahmoud's article are a bit more um, difficult of the articles you read. So it's not a bad idea to, to, um, to be really careful when you read those texts. Okay, I'm going to end here and we'll continue with the next part.